and welcome to John Hockenberry, host of The Takeaway. How you doing, John? Hey, Sharon. It's great to talk to you. Yeah. Let's talk about what's been going on this week. The story with Jonah Lehrer has it must have everybody in New York and even on this coast talking. Um, he resigned from The New Yorker uh, after it was found that he had fabricated quotes in his book, Imagine. Uh, I met this guy and was absolutely, you know, charmed by him, struck by how young he uh, was. And it seems like a tragic story kind of all the way around. A young writer who is um, caught doing something pretty sloppy and basically looks like he's ended his career. What do you think of this? You know, I don't want to comment on whether his career is ended or not. I know Joan. I've known him for, for a little while. Uh, we're, we're friends. I, you know, I couldn't be more devastated by what's happened. Um, and I think uh, it, it's hard to speculate on uh, what he did other than to say that it was a mistake. Clearly, I mean, they pulled his book, the publishers pulled his book. Um, I think in some sense, what you're dealing with here are the new pressures for authors who have to, uh, you know, sell themselves and and be a persona that, that is kind of dynamic and alive. It's not like the old days where you would write a book, uh, you spend maybe a week or so uh, promoting the book, and then you go back into the garret and, and basically do the research and go and get the quotes Nowadays, there's really a tendency to repurpose material. I mean, in, in some ways, even talking to you right now, I'm repurposing commentary and conversations that I've had about Joan Allaire on my program. <sighs> it's obviously completely different. But that, yeah, come on. Let's, we're not talking about cutting and pasting stuff from your radio show and talking about it on, on a video. That's not what we're talking about. And even when, no, he, when it, even, it, even the issue it, of self it, hang on a second. When, we, when he was caught self self plagiarizing, um, I, I wondered even sort of what kind of what kind of uh, sin that was. But it turned out to be a harbinger of what of what occurred this week. So I mean, you're not defending well, I'm, what I'm he did, right? I'm, I'm absolutely not defending him. I am just saying that you know clearly there was this pressure to self plagiarize, and, and then he crossed a line where it, he was. It, it seemed to me desperately kind of concocting content to satisfy the premise of his book, which was profound and probably didn't need any embellishment, and right. he makes arguments well on its own. So, you know, I think it's it's more about the desperation of, of authorship today combined with his, I think, personality, and I think, you know, Jonah is someone with, with the anxiety, and he's certainly created a lot more for himself now, mm. and, and I think he just crossed the line, and you know, lost himself morally as a journalist, and you know, we've seen this in the past. I mean, I think you know the Jason Blair story has some of the same kinds of uh, elements to it. There's a there's a ruthlessness to the Jason Blair thing that's a little uh, a little different here. But but hang but, on, yeah. And know, the I, thing I, the, the I, thing that distinguishes it for me also, I I take, totally take your point about Jason Blair, but here I also think it's so much a sign of our times where things happen at such warp speed, so that his celebrity. Jonas happened at warp speed. He hit the New York Times bestseller list. He was at every conference on every show. He gets a gig at the New Yorker. That's the best gig in journalism. There, that's what every reporter dreams of, right? And to get that at such such a young age and at such speed, I think we do uh, a disservice to young talented writers by not giving them a place where they can make mistakes. And, and certainly publishers don't do their authors any favors by supporting them in terms of fact-checking and stuff like that. I can say that as, as a published author myself. So, I think the one of the pieces, there's a, there's a pressure to outdo. I mean, I think in some ways, Jonah Lair is a protege of Malcolm Gladwell. And, and Gladwell, you know, there, there's no comparison between Lair and Gladwell. And but, but Gladwell, he went through... The, the fire of the Washington Post newsroom. I worked with Malcolm at the Washington Post where you have all of those basic, basic news gathering, fact-checking principles deeply, deeply ingrained in you, and he didn't have that. And I'm saying in today's very atomized world, it is very hard to find a place to get that kind of training. And so I think, I think Joe Dallaire is probably not going to be the last example of that. And, it, and it's, it's really too bad because we, we're all the poor, I think, for that. And you step into the Gladwell shoes. You have to be Gladwell, whether no matter what your training is, and you got to do it in five minutes. And that's not to excuse anything of, of Jonah Lair. It, it's just such a different world from when you and I came up and when uh, Gladwell came up. Don't date me. Okay. <laughs> Let's.
let's talk about let's talk about this lawsuit between Apple and Samsung over the the design of these these new phones. Apple is claiming that Samsung stole their design. What do you think about that? It's pretty interesting. Well, Apple has created essentially the universal portal for the smartphone and then extended that to the iPad. And and I think the, the power of that design is that it immediately becomes ubiquitous. Everybody goes, I want one of those. Well, a smartphone interacting graphically and uh, you know face-to-face -face doing what we're doing on a smartphone is the Apple interface. It, it, it's absolutely ubiquitous, and the power of that design is Apple's strength, but the weakness of the case in terms of patent infringement is that if everybody thinks, what are you, what are you talking about? You can't invent something like that. It's, it's what a phone is. It's, it's like the rotary dial. What do you mean? You, you can patent that? Well, it turns out you can patent designs, but the, the key issue in this case is going to be people feeling like, that doesn't belong to Apple. That's that belongs to the United Nations. Well, it's almost like you're trying to chase something after the barn door has left. I mean, it, it would be, in some ways, to take a different analogy, like you're patenting the bicycle. Two wheels and a handlebar, that's kind of what now defines the bicycle. I think that they were all different ones at the turn at, at the beginning of the 20th century. But And I think that Bill Gates has said many times that... Um, uh, that Steve Jobs stole ideas from uh, Microsoft, from Sun Systems, where they, where they worked. So, you know, it seems like a never-ending cycle. This this idea. Everything came from Xerox Park, and I think there's a case here, and the court case is going to be fascinating to watch with some very high-powered lawyers. The issue really is going to be after this case, where is intellectual property and these kinds of designs going to be? How much proprietary ownership can people have of this stuff? And I think it's going to diminish. And a lot of money at stake. Let's talk about the Olympics, uh, which everybody's watching this week. And we watched uh, great gymnastics, and Gabby Douglas is a new star. Uh, we've yeah. seen this amazing uh, rivalry between um, Ryan Lochte and uh, Michael Phelps in the, in the pool. Uh, it's been kind of a fun week. What are your thoughts about the Olympics? What's catching your eye? Well, first of all, the uh, new ascent that uh, is, is coming out uh, this fall is, is going to be called Chlorine. <laughs> the Olympics, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> By Calvin Klein. <laughs> that is, of course, a lie. Uh, you know, all due respect to John Lair. Uh, let me just say here that the fascinating thing about the Olympics for me was watching the AT&T smartphone commercial, which had on it the swimming race of the uh, young American swimmer who run the, won the world record moments before. Now, it was taped delayed on NBC, so it wasn't like somebody – ran that video up to the room and they, and they put it into the commercial in 30 seconds or something. But you're going to see more and more of this integration between the content in the programming and the content in the ads. Sports is a platform. The Olympics is a platform. It's always been a platform for programming. You're going to see now the ad synergy seeping into the fictional programming as well, way beyond product placement. And that is just beginning. It's pretty interesting. It, it, it feels like when you're watching it often, you cannot tell when the NBC programming ends and where the, where the commercials begin. And in a sense, notice, yeah. Have you noticed what they're doing? When they announce these sort of profile pieces, when, the, the Olympic, when Costas or somebody goes away and says, and now a profile piece from Lester Holt, before the piece rolls, there's an ad in there. Mm -hmm. so, so for like 20 seconds or 30 seconds, there's an ad in there, then the piece rolls, then there's an ad on the other side of it as well. Maybe that's why we're hearing that uh, NBC may not lose money on the Olympics because usually it's a loss leader. This year, it seems like uh, they may actually make some money. Hey, Comcast is going to be GE, right? This is their first Olympic. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, John, thanks very much. Really fun talking to you. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Derek. Hey, you take care. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Don't get any quotes now. <laughs>